With MailChimp, you get a whole lot more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. That means you can connect your data to make more informed, smarter decisions. And you get powerful automation tools like our customer journey builder to ensure you never miss an opportunity to turn shoppers into loyal customers. So if you're ready to integrate your marketing and boost sales, get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. All right, NYB community, thank you so much for joining us right back here. This is episode 274 of the Minding Your Business podcast, entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's still no business without minding your own. There's still no business like minding your own. Uh, I'm your host, Champ Ron. We're here recording this on Friday, July the 23rd of 2021. We are just mowing ahead through this year. I just tell you, I just can't believe it, man. We're coming up on August. Um, we're, we're knee deep in the middle of the third quarter. I hope that uh, as you're listening to this, it's finding you well, personally and professionally. Uh, some of you have gotten out and been able to do some travel and that sort of thing, personal and professional, uh, which is good. I always love to hear your feedback as you guys email me and uh, kind of hit me up and let me know what you have going on. I, I love hearing the stories. I love seeing the pictures and all that type of thing. So continue to reach out to me. Uh, champ 10 k Dot com is where you can do that. Go to champ10k.com. That's where you can connect with me on social media. You can connect with all my links, uh, various resources and things like that that I provide. And I love, love, love being able to do that just for you. So again, hope this is finding you in good spirits. I know there's a lot still going on. Uh, there's this Delta variant going on that's uh, got people a little uh, up in arms again, as we thought we were kind of coming or rounding out through the pandemic, but uh, we're going to continue to get through this thing and continue to work together uh, as we normally do. Hey, listen, I'm so excited to have a, a great guest today out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Ohio is one of the great states that I, I enjoy and enjoy traveling to. I've uh, got some really good relationships there in that state. Dave Menz joins us. He's a, a tremendous proprietor there, um, a, a, just a multi-million dollar chain uh, called Queen City Laundry, and uh, he's also a podcaster. So we love our fellow podcasters, the Laundry Mat Millionaire. Uh, listen, put your hands together. We have my guy Dave Menz here in the building. Thank you so much, Dave. We appreciate having you. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to chat today. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm excited to chat with you. And um, yep. listen, everybody, make sure you go to laundromatmillionaire.com. Make sure you do that uh, while you're listening to us uh, now. And then even once we get done, make sure you go there, support uh, Dave uh, in his endeavor. Send him a nice message. Let him know that you heard him right here on the Money Your Business podcast. And be sure to subscribe to his podcast, okay? Because we love supporting our fellow podcasters, right, NYB community? So make sure you go wherever you get your pods. Go to Laundromat Millionaire Podcast, subscribe to the podcast, listen to it, all right? Leave a five-star positive comment, written comment. Don't just hit the five stars. Leave a written comment and, and let Dave know that um, you, know, you appreciate what he does. Uh, oftentimes, as entrepreneurs, um, it can be a very thankless uh, you know, kind of proposition. And so let's do that. I want to do that myself, and I'd like for you guys to do that as well. But again, Dave, we're, we appreciate having you, man, and we want to jump right into it with you, man. All right, let's do it. I appreciate the intro. That was very kind of you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, all right. So you get your start there in Ohio. Um, I got the sense looking at your bio that you didn't grow up with a silver spoon and a view of the ocean, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly didn't. In fact, I didn't even see the ocean until I was uh, almost 20 years old. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so I certainly did not. No, I grew up pretty, uh, pretty poor. Uh, in Flint, Michigan, actually, state yeah. just north of us in Ohio. There you go. And uh, yeah, my parents were married in high school, had a kid in high school, which was my two-year-old older brother. Yeah. And uh, so we were always kind of we were always kind of behind the eight ball growing up. Uh, my dad's a good man, worked really hard, and kind of clawed out, clawed us out of poverty to probably lower middle class is what most people would be considering it um, when I when I graduated from high school. Um, so we didn't stay in poverty my whole life, but we, in the middle there, about 10 years old, we moved to Ohio, 
uh, for Michigan. My dad got a job offer here. Yeah. And uh, that's how I ended up in Cincinnati. And uh, I love Cincinnati and love the state of Ohio. And I'm a big fan. I've lived here for about 35 years now. So even though I was, even though I was kind of raised the first 10 years of my life in Michigan, and there's no doubt there's a piece of that that's still home to me, a lot of family there and things like that. Cincinnati is definitely home to me too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of a, a little bit uh, interesting considering the relationship between uh, Ohio and Michigan, certainly when you think about uh, college football. <laughs> no doubt about yeah. it. It's a, it's, it's a little ironic. I'm actually a diehard Michigan fan. Oh, wow. Uh, living in Ohio. And the only reason my dad agreed to move here, my dad was a big Michigan fan too, yeah. was because it was in Cincinnati. And yeah, he said if not the job Columbus. offer would come from Columbus, we would not have been moving there. <laughs> but, you know, it's been really good for my cultural experiences yeah. because I was raised, totally jokingly, but I was raised that Ohio State fans are all terrible people. Oh, wow. Uh, totally joking. But when we moved to Cincinnati, many, many, many of my best friends are Ohio State fans. Yeah. Uh, so we don't talk on game day usually. Of course. Um, especially lately, because I don't have much to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but right. yeah, no, there's a lot, a lot of good people in the state of Ohio, no doubt about yep, it. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt about it. And definitely shout out to the Wolverines there in uh, in Michigan. I've had a chance to to uh, spend some time on that campus and tour that campus. It's uh, very nice. And then Beautiful. certainly, um, yeah, you know, there in in Buckeye Country, there in Columbus, uh, definitely for sure. So, so Dave, as you're coming up, and and you mentioned, you know, your dad working very hard and kind of, you know, along with your mother, you know, transitioning you guys to kind of a, this lower middle class, where does entrepreneurship come into play for you? Um, was that fairly early or did that kind of come later? Well, I, I always tell people, I, you know, I, I think at this point in my life, I'm comfortable saying that I was born an entrepreneur. Hmm. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how, but it's just always been in my DNA and everything that I've wanted to do. Um, as a young kid, when I graduated from kindergarten, my dad tells the story that you know, they have the little lines of kids and they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this kid says, I want to be a doctor and a baseball player. And I said, I want to own my own business. Um, and they all thought it was real cute and funny. Um, uh, but I was serious. I wasn't kidding. And, uh, the interesting thing is I don't, I grew up my whole life, didn't know anyone that was a business owner or an entrepreneur. Um, everybody I knew was poor and you were rich if you were middle class. Um, that was just the real world to me. And it yeah. was, really wasn't about the money. The only thing I can really remember is that it seemed to be a lot about the freedom. Yes. I'm a fiercely stubborn and independent person. And I never <laughs> liked the constraints of working in another company and um, the structure that a lot of people crave, quite honestly, of working sure. for someone else. Um, I just felt like a caged lion. And I did it for a while. Um, I worked in corporate America for a while as a young adult, learning some skills and yeah. things like that. And, and I reminded myself why I didn't want to do that <laughs> and eventually became an entrepreneur myself. But yeah, it's kind of interesting because I, everybody I knew growing up, including my parents would tell me till the day I died that being an entrepreneur was risky. You'll go bankrupt. It's not what it is on TV. You know, nobody makes any <laughs> money that way. It's just Hollywood. Right. Um, and one of my, uh, one of my biggest weaknesses and my biggest strengths is uh, I don't listen very well. <laughs> and so even as a kid and even as an adult, I was going to be an entrepreneur and there was no one on the planet that was going to tell me otherwise. Yeah. Um, well, and so, you, and yeah, you know what? Fierce about it. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, Dave, you, that age old question of, um, you know, are entrepreneurs born or are they, you know, kind of bred or are they taught? You know, is is kind of that long term, you know, everlasting question, and of course, you kind of debunk that uh, for yourself because um, it sounds like you were you're just kind of born an entrepreneur, born with that natural mindset uh, to to take risks uh, that allow you to uh, live the the lifestyle that you like to live ultimately, right? And uh, there there's just something innate in you know entrepreneurs that have that mindset that they're they're willing to take those type of risk. Because it, and risk relative to how the majority of, of people think, right? That, right. you know, like you said, from the, the workforce standpoint, you know, in, in many people's mind, it's not, that's way less risky. Now, you know, there's some, there's actually some data that would support that uh, the workforce is, is not as secure as uh, many people would think. <laughs> and certainly coming out Absolutely. of the pandemic, there's probably a whole slew of people that would say, ah, you know, <laughs> when you start comparing sure. risk, it's, it's actually maybe less yeah. risky for me to do my own business. <laughs> right. I think it depends on the person, but I found it interesting as I've gotten older and found this whole entrepreneurial world and community that I've always been seeking out. 
um, as a young kid and could never find or connect with people like yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I found it very fascinating that almost everyone I meet that is a business owner and an entrepreneur was raised by business owners and entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, and when I asked them, I'm like, would you have been an entrepreneur if you weren't raised by entrepreneurs to think that way? And every one of them says, I don't know. Like, right. That's just, that's just how I was raised. So I don't know anything else. Yeah. Um, so I always find that fascinating because they usually find it pretty fascinating that I had no one helping me and I had people telling me I was crazy and this was risky and I would go bankrupt and all these things. So it's interesting when you're on different sides of the equation, how you how you view things. Yeah, you know, that that's a great point. And, you know, for myself, you know, Dave, I, I didn't grow up with uh, kind of entrepreneur parents. Um, but okay. my dad was able to kind of like your dad, he was able to, you know, really kind of level himself up over over time. Right. Just with mm-hmm. you know, that grit, that grind, that hard work and, and you know, my mom's support and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, not kind of full fledged in entrepreneurship. Um, he got into leadership within the organization as he is to, you know, today. But, you know, never kind of like owning, you know, as far as his own business. But, you know, right. it, it, nonetheless, both were very supportive of me. Um, as I kind of went down that road, um, even coming out of you know a long term kind of run in, in the banking industry, uh, which I spent 17 years in before, you know, really kind of going full time into you know what I do today, which is you know buying and, and sell real estate and help people, you know, kind of transition from from tenant to to owner, uh, is a big okay. piece of, of my business. So, sure. So yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Yeah, no yeah I mean, my parents, my parents were great supportive parents. They loved each other and loved me very much. They told me I could be anything I wanted to be. And then when I said I wanted to be an entrepreneur, they were like, but not that. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> so, of course, I was like, well, that's what I'm doing then. Right. That's right. Exactly. That one thing. <laughs> that's, right. Right. Exactly. So, funny world. Funny world. It but is. But now they're obviously very proud of me and everything. So, it's all. It's all come for a circle, and I haven't told him I told you so. Right. Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, it's going to say one day, right. Yeah, you just show it with the balance sheet and say, hey, see? Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of that, and we talk about the balance sheet and that sort of thing, you know, I was reading that you, and, and you know, for everybody listening, of course, you're in the that kind of the laundromat business, which is really right. so intriguing. Um, and I want to really get your thoughts on this, um, Dave, because it's not a – it is it, it's, it's not one of these when you think of today's you know people starting businesses right you think of people in the tech space and people in you know these you know kind of really just like dope like really innovative you know lanes right you know california right. texas you know new york all that type of thing and then here you are with a multi million dollar laundromat business which is a a business model that's been around for decades and decades and decades and it's had its innovations right but it's still kind of its base model and absolutely you know you found a way to kind of master that um you know and, and i read that you got started you bought your first laundromat off craigslist <laughs> which i loved <laughs> yeah so talk about that a little bit what what led you to the laundromat business and and how you picked up your first one off craigslist yeah so when i uh you know when i was in my late 20s i realized hey i've been in corporate america for almost 10 years I had been promoted uh, five times in the company I worked for, the local phone company here in Cincinnati, and I was making a nice middle-class living. Considering I didn't go to college, um, you know, I was kind of living the American dream, the white picket fence. My wife was a school teacher with her master's degree, and yeah. we had a nice, you know, middle-class, upper-middle-class lifestyle. And for whatever reason, around 28 years old, I just looked at myself in the mirror one day and said, you're a sellout. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, like, I'm not living my dream. Like, I was... I was a lineman for the phone company, so I was climbing telephone poles and those types of things. And I thought, you still want to be doing this when you're 58 or 68 years old? You know, it's hard work. Yeah. Um, but it was the only way I could make a decent living. And uh, so the reality is I just looked at myself in the mirror one day and said, you know, you always want to be your own business owner. That's no doubt who you are to your core. Maybe you need to actually do something about it. Because one of the things about growing up in poverty is you – you learn very early in life that no one's going to give you anything. Mm. But I also learned very early in life that if I wanted anything, I could go get it because I lived in America. And whether it was delivering newspapers or cutting grass, or I mean, nobody was going to stop me from going and getting what I want, but they certainly weren't going to show up at my door and hand it to me, including my parents. That's a fact. Because uh, they didn't have anything to give me. Um, and that was a foundational lesson that I learned through, quite frankly, a lot of pain and tears um, as a young kid. 
Yeah. Um, but the reality is, you know, it kind of reminded me when I, when I was in my late twenties, Hey, I'm, you know, I remember looking in the mirror one day and thinking you're a sellout, but you know what? You're only 28 years old. I mean, that's pretty young. You can go do anything you want to do at this point. Yeah. So I had a foundational conversation with my wife that night who I had told for years and years that I wanted to own my own business someday. And, uh, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm serious and we need to do something about this. Yeah. And uh, we had a nice lifestyle. We weren't in debt or anything, but we didn't really have a lot of money saved up other than just our retirement money. Um, and so we knew we would need some seed money. And so she and I made the decision that day that as we continue to make more and more money, which we did over the next few years, that we would keep our lifestyle pretty modest, live below our means, and basically save money for seed business or seed, seed money for a business. And we didn't know what business it would be. We had no idea. And frankly, I didn't even care. Um, yeah. I didn't care what the product was. I've just always loved capitalism and business in its purest form, which is servitude, yes. service to others and to your community. And I've always loved everything about that. I've been fascinated by it. And so that's where the game that I wanted to play. Um, and so long story short, me and my wife for the next four or five years, we lived below our means. We saved every penny we could. Um, I mean, we didn't sell everything or anything like that. We just didn't upgrade our lifestyle. Yeah. And, uh, Every, every year, we just had, you know, an extra six or $7,000 to go towards a business. In year two, we had 12. In year three, we had 20. And, <laughs> you know, it started to get, open up a few more options to what we could buy. Um, around year four or five, we had, I think, roughly twenty five thirty thousand dollars $30,000 saved up for a business. And for that entire time frame, I had been looking everywhere I could look on planet Earth for businesses for sale or start businesses or whatever. And I always came to the conclusion that this one wasn't for me. Whatever hmm. idea these were, some red flags just jumped up and was like, yeah, this is the wrong opportunity. Um, and a lot of times it revolved around the fact that I knew even when I bought a small business that it probably wouldn't pay enough to justify quitting my job. And I had a young family, I had three kids. Um, and so I knew whatever job that, or whatever business I bought, at least temporarily, I would be able, need to be able to run kind of on the side. Um, and so that eliminated a lot, <laughs> a lot yeah. of businesses. And uh, especially back, back then, this is, you know, once again, 12, 13 years ago now, um, and so long story short, I was scrambling along on tra uh, Craigslist, which I had done a million times. And back then they had a category that just said businesses for sale and you could click on your city. It would show you all the businesses for sale on Craigslist in Cincinnati, for example. And I had scrolled this thing a million times over those five years. And this one day I'm scrolling through and I just see laundromat for sale. And I look it up and it's in Amelia, Ohio, which is a suburb that I've grown up in. And I thought, well, man, I know where that is. It's right up the road. And so I jumped in my car within five minutes and ran, ran up there, and I was two or three miles away, <clears throat> and this place was a dump. I mean, it was the stereotypical laundromat in every way, that all the negative connotation associated with a laundromat that everyone thinks of, this place was. And it's basically the only reason it was in my budget, <laughs> just because it was a hot mess. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, and I didn't know the industry, but I knew this, uh, com I knew my community very well. Yeah. And I called the business owner. We talked for a few minutes. He didn't really give me any information. Um, and I just said, you know what? I think I'm interested in this. Could we set up time to meet up here and talk in a few weeks? And so we did. And over the next few weeks, I just dug like I've never dug in my life into the niche that is laundromats. Yeah. And met with equipment distributors, searched online, went and visited all the competitors in the area within like a 20-mile radius. Yeah. And within two weeks, I came to the conclusion I didn't really know much about the laundromat industry, but I do understand the laws of supply and demand. Yes. And I knew people needed a laundromat, and I knew they were all dumps. I mean, I visited nine laundromats within a 20-mile radius of this store, and yeah. all of them were just completely awful, awful the way they were run. Wow. And the only time I do, the only way I do anything in life is well. Like, I, I'm either, I always say I'm hot or cold. I'm either 150 miles an hour or I'm at a dead stop. I'm as passionate as anyone on planet Earth, or I just do not care. Yeah. There's no middle ground for me. And so I knew if I got into this industry, I would learn the industry over time, and I would want to reinvest and you know, fix the business up and make it really nice and make it a community asset versus a community eyesore, basically. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't know a whole lot, but I just figured, well, I can't afford it. The numbers work. I can run it on the side, still keep my job, so I don't have much risk because I didn't have much debt. And I just thought to myself, well, it makes sense to me that if I fix this up and make it pretty nice, even if it takes a year or two, um, that the business would pick up as I fix it up and make it nicer. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's what I did. And within eight or nine months, the business went from losing money, which is what it was doing when I bought it, um, to making a couple thousand dollars a month. 
which for a nice little side business that doesn't really distract you from your full-time career, I thought, man, I've hit the lottery. <laughs> you know, that was like my house payment. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. geez, I'm 30 years, 32 years old. And you know, my house payment's covered by my little side business. Right. Um, and uh, so that's how I got into the business. And I just kind of fell in love with the industry. And my mindset was pretty simple. It was like, well, if I did this once, why couldn't I do it again? Yeah. And so I did it again. You know, and, and, and again, something. And again, and again. Wow, wow. And, you know, Dave, something I, I love about, I mean, you gave a lot of great nuggets with, um, you know, as you were describing your story, uh, you know, one, the communication with your wife and the support that uh, that, that she provided um, as a spouse is, is, is really tremendous. Um, you took kind of a long play to get there. Um, so instead of yeah. kind of going out and kind of getting a loan and kind of being, you know, kind of somewhat just kind of strapped with debt before you even get into the business to even learn it and learn how to operate it and kind of what your play would be. Um, you just kind of took the long road of just kind of saving your money and you talked about living modestly. Right. And I think a lot of times with entrepreneurs, because we're in this microwave, uh, kind of society, you know, as soon as we get an idea, we think we've got to pounce on it right at that moment. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you took uh, actually uh, just a handful of years, you and your wife just kind of being diligent uh, to do that. And then when you found the opportunity, I, I just love your mindset because it really ma matches and ma resonates with mine and, and my business partner in terms of being that kind of fiduciary to the community um, with your business. Yeah. And um, sometimes with businesses that, uh, you know, that are like you know, a laundromat. You know, sometimes those owners are, are don't have quite that mindset, right? And uh, and that reflects in how they're ran. And so, I, I think what it sounds like is you took kind of your entrepreneurship mindset, along with some of the skills you learned in corporate, and you meshed those things together in this nice kind of, you know, for the Southerners, kind of this nice gumbo. <laughs> um, and then you go about your business with, you know, kind of you know this mesh of. Yeah, obviously the, the capitalism piece of owning business, but you kind of have this mission base, right, that you go out with. And, and I, I like that because that's that's how I go about um, from a real estate perspective. And so I just love that approach. Yeah, the way I was raised, Ron, <clears throat> is pretty simple. We're here to serve each other. Yes. And I think one of the things that I was fascinated by and loved about pure capitalism and business ownership um, is that the people that are the most successful, it's generally speaking, and I know there's exceptions, but generally speaking, based on pure servitude. Yes. Uh, the people that have what I call the heart of a servant are typically, you can point to them being very successful, especially over a long, consistent period of time, because they really don't focus too much on the money. This is, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the big misconceptions of the best entrepreneurs out there, is most of them do not focus on the money. They're not chasing the yacht and the Lamborghini. They're chasing serving their community and impacting the world and leaving a legacy. Yes. So when you do those things, what happens is the money just chases you. Um, and it may take some time. It took five or six years of, you know, we didn't take any money out of the business for four or five years. And we snowballed one into two and two into three. And that was when I finally quit my job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's one of the things that I love about what I call the game of business um, is that, you know, I, I feel very comfortable and I will continue to feel very comfortable and sleep well at night. Uh, knowing that no matter how much wealth I create in my life, it's never done at someone's expense. It's always done in servitude to someone. Mm. And so I don't ever have to feel guilty. I, I was just joking with a client earlier today, a coaching client of mine. And I said, you know, if I'm someday a billionaire, and then I laughed and was like, okay, laundromat millionaire may be a thing. Laundromat billionaire, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but I said, you know, if I'm ever a billionaire, I will still not feel like the greedy, rich old man that a lot of society makes them out to be. Right. Um, because I'll know that I have made, every penny I've made um, has been through what I call a win-win relationship. Yes. Um, you know, every, it's all back to servitude. And my mentor early on in my business journey um, taught me that his dad taught him. He was a second generation business person. And his dad taught him, Steve, if you just focus on serving other people, the money will find you. The money will follow. And his quote uh, to his son was that uh, money is just a way of keeping score. It just tells you it's, it's not the result of, or it is the result of doing good business for good people and serving others. But it's not the goal. The goal should not be to make a bunch of money. It's a byproduct. The goal should be serving and impacting the world and your community and leaving a legacy. And then you can buy all the toys you want, buy the nice house, buy nice pools, spoil your kids rotten, go on nice vacations, 
give back to the community in other ways and you can just feel like that that's what a fulfilled life should feel like and look like um and and that's really what business is and should be i understand there are situations where that's not the case but sure. that's what i always was enamored with and still am to this day i love everything that it is uh entrepreneurship and business ownership yeah absolutely dave Menz is our guest today uh the laundromat millionaire uh definitely check out the laundromat millionaire podcast uh multi-million dollar uh owner uh, and proprietor of queen city laundry uh right there in cincinnati ohio you talked about when you transitioned from your job, Dave, and I don't want to hone in on that because many people listening, uh, the, the, one of the questions that I often get from our audience is, you know, well, well Champeron, when did you know, you know, that, you know, to be able to transition it, what, what was that exact point, right? Where you knew, was it, you know, where you, you know, did you have this bag of money and you just went and told your boss what he could go do with himself or <laughs> did you, you know, did you just walk, you know, did you, you know, you know, kind of put in your two week notice and, you know, at, at what point did you know to do that? I and mean, were you comfortable doing that? So I'll ask you that question, Dave, you know, what, what was the, kind of that exact point when you and, and your wife kind of knew, okay, it's, we're, we're good to be able to step away from, from the workforce. Well, the, um, I'm really big on being open and transparent with people. And the truth is that I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And the main reason was I got a job, an entry-level position at Cincinnati Bell when I was 19 years old. Yeah. And I was promoted from within. I was trained with it from within. I had no education outside of the phone company. All the skills that I learned were really only applicable. I mean, I had customer service skills and things like that, but nothing really translatable to another industry. And I was in a union position that was a pretty oh, well-paid yeah. position that was based on seniority and sure. all the things that come with that. And so the day I quit, I was basically 19 again. Like, I couldn't go back. Um, the only thing I could have really done is move to another city and maybe became a telephone lineman or something like that. Uh, <laughs> that was about it. And so when I quit, I mean, I was like all in, uh, and I had a young family. And once again, my wife's a school teacher. They, they don't exactly make a ton of money. Right. Um, and so it was, the truth is it was terrifying. Um, but to back up a second, the reality is that me and my wife focused on from day one, when we made this business profitable, we kept our hands out of the cookie jar. For four and a half years, we never took anything out of the business, mainly because we were already living well below our means. We had good jobs. We had a reasonable middle-class lifestyle. Um, and we, you know, we took one, a nice vacation every year, but it wasn't a big deal to not take four. I right. mean, we didn't really feel like we were sacrificing. We had reliable cars, but they weren't $50,000 SUVs. But right. we didn't feel like we were really sacrificing that much, to be honest with you, uh, mainly because that's kind of the lifestyle she and I both grew up with. Yeah. And so what, what really ended up happening is we just snowballed one year after another and two and three and four. And we always lived below our means, but every year we were more financially secure because we both still had our jobs. We had less debt and the businesses made more and more money yeah. because we just kept everything the businesses made. We reinvested back into them, making them better and better and better and better. Absolutely. And my wife is a very financially conservative person. So for her, living below our means, saving, squirreling away money paying off debt, building assets that generate revenue. That was all good news to her <laughs> until I wanted to quit my job. Right. <laughs> and then that was terrifying to her and me both. Yeah. Um, but the reality is we've gotten really comfortable with a couple nice laundromats that made quite a bit of money for us. Yeah. And we never took anything out of it. But we always, I remember before I quit my job, I remember thinking one day, you know, there was a time where if I got laid off or fired from my job, like it would literally be financially devastating for probably the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, because I didn't really have a backup plan. Right. And as these businesses became more and more profitable, I felt more and more secure in the fact that I didn't need my job anymore. Yes. Uh, and so that was, it was, it was a slow evolution of like a lot of emotions and fear and, and then eventually lack of fear and all these things. And basically what happened is, you know, laundromats, they're, they're known as being a semi-passive business. They're a very flexible business. It's one of the beautiful things about the laundromat industry. Sure. But they're not passive. And that's a lot of people like to sell them that way. It's like, oh, they just run themselves. You don't have to do anything. Just collect <laughs> right. your money. And that's not how this works. Right. So the reality is during those three or four or five years, I worked 90 to 100 hours a week between my job, my commute, and uh, taking care of my laundromats and fixing them up and sweat equity and things like that. Yeah. I was pretty burned out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but we got to the point where I could quit my job. And the reality is we just 
we had just put our third uh, store under contract and we were going to be closing in about two weeks. Yeah. And it was also a dump. It also needed a ton of work. And I had these other two laundromats that just kept growing and growing and needing more and more time. Yeah. And I just looked at my wife and I said, you know, I don't think the situation's ever going to be perfect, but I have to quit my job. Like I cannot do a third store yeah. and keep doing this. And we had sacrificed so much. I mean, she was basically a single mom for three and a half, four years Wow. with three little kids. When we bought our first laundromat, our baby was three weeks old. My wife was still on maternity leave. Wow. Oh, <laughs> when we bought our first one. And at the same time, our, our, our middle kid was a two year old toddler. Yeah. Um, so we had soccer. I mean, all those hours I was working, well, guess who's taking care of the family and the babies and the groceries and I mean, everything yeah. was her. So we both sacrificed a lot and we were both scared to death, but the reality is it was just time. And so we just jumped and, yeah. uh, I'm a very ambitious, hardworking man, um, probably to a fault sometimes. And there was, I just, I just said, you know what, this is going to work or I'm going to die. Because <laughs> there's no, there is no alternative. Failure yeah. is not an option when you when you jump like that. And uh, the beauty is because we were so well prepared, we had been so disciplined that when I jumped, it just allowed me to focus full time on my business. And I spent more time on my businesses than ever before, but worked less than I had in five or six years. Yeah. And wow. my family flourished. My businesses flourished. Uh, I mean, the businesses went from really good businesses to just straight to the moon. Um, we started building a real substantial team where I'd had a kind of a somewhat fractured small business team. Yeah. Um, I mean, nowadays we, we have 40 employees. Um, so we have a pretty substantial operation at this point. Um, and that was kind of the, the jumping off of that really taking, uh, building a substantial team to another level. And it, uh, you know, we didn't know if it would work or not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what being yeah. an entrepreneur sometimes is like. Once again, back to that transparency, it's not it's not always you know sexy, and you don't like you said you don't just have piles of you know, or I didn't have uh, bags of money, and you just go tell the boss to kiss it. Right. That's just <laughs> that's not usually reality for more people. Usually, it's like yeah, here's my two weeks notice, and the whole two weeks you're thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? And one day passes, and another day passes, and you get to your last day of work, or somewhere you've worked for 17 years. And you're in yeah. your prime and everybody you work with thinks you're insane. They're like, you're quitting a really good job with no college education in your prime. With MailChimp, you get a whole lot more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. That means you can connect your data to make more informed, smarter decisions. And you get powerful automation tools like our customer journey builder to ensure you never miss an opportunity to turn shoppers into loyal customers. So if you're ready to integrate your marketing and boost sales, Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. With MailChimp, you get more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. With things like data-driven recommendations and powerful automation tools. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. And you can't come back? Like, are you insane? Wow. <laughs> and so right. you think, am I, maybe I am insane. What am I doing? You know, uh, and your wife thinks it, and your kids right. think it, and your parents think it. Uh, so anyway, crazy, crazy situation. Wow. Wow. That, that, that's amazing day for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's crazy to think about, but yeah, I mean, you know, having, you know, that type of, of position where you're kind of, you know, somewhat a made man and you, you, you know, it, it, it's not easy to just come back to and that sort of thing, you know, to step out on that faith like that is just, uh, just truly yeah. amazing. And let me, let me ask you uh, uh, for when you're buying or you're looking to purchase a laundromat, you know, what, what are you looking for? Like, what are, what are some kind of high level things that you're looking for that makes it a good deal? And, and when you buy them, are you buying the real estate along with it? Or is it just, you know, just the business? Um, yeah, the first couple I bought, we didn't have a lot of money, so we leased those. Um, okay. Now we own two. Now we own two of our four buildings that our stores are in, and then another, our third of fourth, um, third of four stores, um, we have right on first refusal. It's a small, it's a small ten thousand square foot shopping center, and our store occupies about five thousand of the square feet. So we occupy yeah. about half of it. I have right of first refusal, so I'll. I will buy that property someday. Sure. Uh, but early on, you know, we just leased because we, we had to pour every penny we had into making the businesses better. Yeah. Uh, so that was the, 
that was a quick version, but to answer your question on what makes them great, it's a, it's a lot of the stereotypical things that makes any business better, but there's a few caveats in every industry. Um, location is everything. And a laundromat is really no different. Um, yeah. You know, you could, you could take over a laundromat that's in a good or subpar location, um, and if all of your competitors um, operate below par, then you can operate well and make up for the fact that you're not in a great location. But I don't ever recommend any of my coaching clients do that, and I never do that. And the main reason is everything I do in my business, I want them to be what I call uncompetable. And what I mean by that is if a competitor decided to come in and do things differently in, uh, in any of my competitors' locations, like it was a rundown dump and somebody bought it and said, I'm going to fix it up, I want to always be in a position where I say, okay, the only thing they can do is do things as well as me. Mm. Their value proposition can never exceed our value proposition. And I've always really felt like the foundation of that starts with one thing, which is the location. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's many other factors, of course, but that's the primary one that I really look for. Now, back to the competitive analysis for a second, when you're looking at an existing laundromat, I, I estimate roughly 75% of the laundromats in this country are just in terrible disrepair. Yeah. It's just the reality of our industry for many, many reasons. The good news is that means there's a lot of opportunity for somebody that's intrigued by and knows how to get into the industry and run business, run laundromats. Um, <clears throat> roughly 15% of the industry is what I call top of the industry. And these are modern day, beautiful laundromats that are well run with well, well oiled machines. Yeah. And that's kind of where we are now, but we certainly weren't always there. And that business model at the top of the industry like that is, is I always tell people it's the best small business in America. And mm. I absolutely believe that to my core. So a big part of getting to the top of the industry is having a great location, but a big part of getting into the industry is about finding that great location, but finding it in a market or a sub market, which is like a three, five mile radius around the store. Yeah. Um, where the laws of supply and demand are tipped in your favor as a business owner. And so my first store, my second store, actually all of my stores were, those were that, they were that situation. And what I mean by that is when you visit those nine laundromats within a 20 mile radius, is the community properly being served? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be just the 12th pizza place right. in town with yeah. 11 other pizza stores, or I don't at least. Right. Um, the reality is, you know, I want to, <clears throat> I want to serve the community. And by doing that, I want to serve the community in an area where it's not already being properly served. So from a business and an economic perspective, that makes all the sense in the world. But financially speaking, but I don't only do it for the finances. I also do it because it's important to me. It's a part of why I get up every day and do what I do. Yes, the money is nice. And yes, I want to be able to pay my bills and support my family. But I also don't want to think I'm just out there selling a widget that nobody needs. Mm. I'm out there making a difference in the world and the community. So one of the beauties of the laundromat industry across the country and really even the world <clears throat> is because there's so many places where the laws of supply and demand, the communities are not being served properly. Yeah. And the fact that a laundromat is a vital community resource, meaning it's not a luxury. It's not like I think I'll get a pizza for dinner. It's the communities need a laundromat. Right. That's why people use these rundown dumps is because they have to use a laundromat and there aren't any nice ones. And so you can really revitalize an entire community um, by taking over an old dumpy laundromat in a market that's underserved in a great location and revitalizing it. Yes. And it'll, it'll change that community's foundation and fiber to its core. I've had hundreds of customers come up over to me over the years with tears in their eyes just thanking wow. me while they're handing me their money. They're just thanking me, just begging me to take their money. And that's what, that's what business ownership and entrepreneurship and capitalism is all about. That's Absolutely. what it's about. And yep. it's okay for money to be part of that. Yeah. It's okay. That's fine. But that's not what we should be chasing. Yeah, no, that that is very well said, Dave. I, I really want well, to let me thank you for I appreciate you for saying that, um, you know, because, you know, many people listening, you know, really need to understand that that piece that, you know, even in the pursuit of, of capitalism. Right. We, again, we still have the responsibility and, and the accountability to be good fiduciaries 
uh, in our communities. And if we can always keep that in mind as we go about it, it just eliminates a lot of the issues that come about when, when you're solely focused on money and, and the pursuit of that and the pursuit of things and, and that sort of thing, sort of thing. And the, the sexiness that sometimes gets shown in the media, uh, around being a business owner. Right. And, you know, I, I just think that it's just, it's really tremendous. And, and quite frankly, with, with our students that we work with, um, with my business partner, Full Circle REI, we do the same thing. We, we start out with that mindset before we even get into real estate deals and transactions and how to analyze deals and all that type of thing, Dave, probably a lot right. like yourself, you're starting with that, that whole mindset and you want to make sure that people have the right spirit, um, the right heart and the right motivation around why they're, they're looking to do what they're looking to do anyway. <laughs> right. Right. It's all about the, what is your why? Yeah. What is your why? But it's okay for money to be one of those. Yeah. It just, at least in my opinion, and I'm not here to judge others in my opinion, with my life, the way I was raised, it's not okay for money to be the only reason. Right. It's okay for money to be part of the reason. Um, and so I, I need that. Like, that's what I, that's what I thrive on. And that's what I need in life. Money just isn't enough. It's not a motivating factor for me, or at least enough of a motivating factor. Yeah. Ironically, I sit here with this business moniker or nickname that people have given me, the laundromat billionaire. Right. <laughs> Which, you know, it doesn't exactly say the laundromat servitude or something. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, the reality is somebody gave me that nickname a while back, and I'm a, I am understand marketing, and I wanted to sure. uh, get people's attention, tell the story that I'm telling you. Right with my book that's coming out in a couple of months and with yeah. my podcast and all these things. And so I understand marketing and I was like, Hey, I think I'm just going to take that moniker and kind of run with it. Yeah. So that's, that's where it came from. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. I love it. Um, you, you mentioned the book and I want to get to that. So let, let's go ahead and talk about yeah. that. Then I want to circle back and ask you real quick, kind of about the pandemic and its impact. Uh, kind yeah. of on business and, and on the community from your perspective, uh, Dave. But, yeah. you know, tell us sure. about the book. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Laundry Met Me in there. Um, you know, definitely looking forward to that and, and kind of, you know, telling even more of your story, um, which I think is really going to resonate with people. Yeah, you know, what's the inspiration behind the book and, and when can we expect it? Yeah, so the book launches October 1st, 2021. Uh, so if you're watching this in the future, it's already out. Uh, if you're watching it soon, it'll be in a couple months. Uh, my pre-sale will be starting in about a month on my website, laundromatmillionaire.com. So I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. Um, but the reality is it's a labor of love. Um, it's a teaching memoir um, is what it is. And so um, I, I encountered a lot of tragedy in my young life. Um, and I won't go into all that right now, but I sure. talk about it and read about it and write about it in my book. And so it was part therapeutic for me because um, I've experienced a lot of tragedy and putting it down on paper, I didn't know that at the time, but putting it down on paper and having to think through and process these things, quite frankly, over and over and over and over and over again, because that's how writing a book happens, Yeah, um, is uh, it was very good for me personally, although I didn't know it. But really what it boiled down to is I just reached a point where I had reached a certain level of success a couple of years ago, um, and I just felt like I had this story to tell. I felt like I had this kind of like, yeah, cliche, kind of rags to riches but it was really more than that for me. It was more about, I'm a big, you know, I always tell people, as I told you earlier in the conversation, Ron, a lot yeah. of people try to talk me out of being a business owner and entrepreneur. That right. it wouldn't work. I'd lose everything. And so, you know, the reality is that there, you know, the internet wasn't what, <laughs> the internet didn't exist when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, but it's certainly what it, what it isn't, wasn't what it is today, even when I was, you know, a young adult. Yeah. Um, and so information wasn't as easily accessible and available back then as it is today. Yeah. But the reality is I still dug for the business magazines and the business books and those types of things. That's where I got a lot of inspiration that it was, that I wasn't crazy, that it was okay to chase my dream, that I could do this, that it would be successful. And so there was, it was part therapeutic. It's part education. Um, you know, I love this industry. I want everyone in the world to know what a great business this is. Um, I have this mission of elevating the industry in the society's mind, meaning um, I don't believe that society uh, should look at the laundromat industry or laundromats in general and automatically have a negative connotation associated with them. Right. Unfortunately, they do, and it's a very well-deserved reputation. But I've decided, because I'm very, um, I'm very grateful and passionate to this industry, because it's not only changed my life, it's changed my family tree. Yeah. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And so I see it as kind of this pay it forward type of moment 
where I want to elevate the industry and I know what entre- what the entrepreneurial world is. I know how the impact that people like you and I can have in the world Absolutely. one longer matter at a time. And so I want the world to know what a great business this is. Um, it's a vital community resource. And I want people to know and understand the value in serving your community monetarily and emotionally. And this is all kind of tied up in my story. And, uh, you know, a big part of it is, hey, I started with really no money. Yeah. Um, you know, I started very poor as a kid, but I mean, even as a young adult, I didn't have a college education. I didn't go to school for business. I didn't really know anyone that even owned a business. I mean, you talk about winging it. I was right. winging it <laughs> and I did a lot of things yeah. wrong and that's, that's all part of the journey. But I eventually, you know, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And if you just keep getting back up, um, good old fashioned grit will take you a long ways. Um, and so that's kind of my story of how I found success was just, I just kept running up against brick walls and they knocked me down to get back up and run at them again. But before I hit them again, I tried to learn a little something from my first lesson. Mm. And so eventually I just busted those brick walls down and I proved to everyone in the world that told me I couldn't do something that I could. Yeah. And so what it boils down to is now in the last three or four years, I've had, feel like I have this story to tell on my heart. And because I want to inspire what I call the Dave, your old, the 10 year old Dave Mintz, mm. the kid that would read those magazines and read those books from people that were writing them for me and to me. Um, and that those things that were inspired me and drove me because I don't know if I would have been if I didn't read those things because everyone in my ear was telling me something different. Yes. Mm. And so I know that's a long winded answer. No, no, that's <laughs> but a the tremendous. reality is that is that is the why of why I wrote the book. Um, I'm not under any illusion that I will be a best-selling author or anything like that. But the reality is I have a very simple mindset when it comes to business. If I change 50 or 100 people's lives, whether it's water mats or a book, if, I, I always say we live in a world where they say you got to have this viral video or podcast of 5 million views to be successful. <laughs> and right. my attitude towards it is always if you put me in a room with 50 people, and, and those and I have impacted those 50 people's lives. If you're physically in a room with them, that seems like a lot of people. Right. Because they're all telling you how great you are and how grateful they are. And they're giving you hugs and they have tears in their eyes for the impact you've made on their lives. And so I don't have this mindset of I have to make I have to change three million lives for it to be worthwhile. Mm. I just have this mindset of I just have to change 50 or 100 people's lives. Yeah. And it doesn't even if when you write a book, it's a it's a living, breathing document that lives forever, hopefully, um, even once I'm gone. And uh, so even if I just that book impacts one person's life every year for 20 years, that's 20 people's lives. And I also take it very seriously that I'm giving back to the communities that that person may go serve. Yeah. Um, so if they take that story and it's, you know, the, the book has probably over half the book is very uh, real, practical, entrepreneurial, actionable lessons specific to the laundromat industry, of course. And so even if you don't care about the story and you don't care about all the other stuff, the reality is if you're intrigued and interested in the laundromat industry, it's a very powerful book in the way that I've wrote it. And it's very, it's going to be very helpful to people that are, that are interested in getting into the industry and serving their community. So for what the price of a book is, um, it's going to be kind of a master class on how to be successful. And if you're in a better place than I was financially when you start, great. Good for you. Nothing wrong with that. All these lessons will still apply to you. You're just in a better starting place. But a big part of me writing the book is to inspire, once again, that poor 10-year-old Dave Menz that that everybody said that you have to have money to make money. Mm. Um, And so I want to inspire people that have this dream and this vision of chasing this entrepreneurial world. Um, out there and making a difference in their community. And I want to be just one of many, like you and out many others, um, that just make this world go around and inspire people to chase their dream. If it's not a laundromat, totally fine with me. I still hope that I inspire someone to chase their dreams. Dave, I, I so love that's why that. I wrote the book. Yeah, man, I, I love that, man. That is, you know, again, it's very in- inspirational. It's very insightful. And uh, I definitely, I, I'm just looking more and more uh, forward to the book. Um, and you said October, right? Kind of October 1st, we can look yep, for it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll have the pre-sale out in about a month, but yeah, October 1st will be the official launch. Yep. Absolutely. So we want to make sure, um, you know, we're in that communication channel, Dave, uh, quite frankly, cause I want to make sure to share that, uh, with the community here. 
uh, as it relates to the Minding Your Business podcast and, and kind of get that out there and, and share so that people, you know, can, can support you by getting a copy of the book. And then even more so, you know, with, with what you've shared, you know, again, be able to help, you know, you know, inspire and, you know, kind of, you know, help, you know, you know, just provide a different perspective on, on life and, and on business uh, that you'll be able to provide to people. Um, that, and quite frankly, in my opinion, people should have. With MailChimp, you get more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. With things like data-driven recommendations and powerful automation tools. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. Yeah, thank you so much. That means the world to me. It really does. And hey, sounds like I already sold one book, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, you, you've got me already. So yeah, I'm already ready. So when when it's ready and yeah, we could do the pre-sale, um, I, I like to show leadership like you do on, on the podcast. So I like to be the first one to to get it, and I want to be able to encourage others. And you know, you know, something I also like to do from time to time is, you know, uh, you know, gather some people and, and maybe even do kind of like a, a book club. Um, you know, type type setting cool. where, you know, uh, you know, several people get together kind of, you know, hey, we, we go chapter by chapter or two chapters and, you know, just kind of read and just kind of discuss it. Um, right. You know, I'd love to be able to, you know, maybe that's something that could be put together at some point. Um, yeah. It would fantastic. be something like that. And maybe if you get a bunch of people, and we hop on a Zoom and uh, yeah, everybody's read it. And then, you know, it, it, I mean, if you could jump in for something like that, that'd be awesome just to. I would you love know, that. just to I be able to ask that. you, hey, Dave, you know, on page 10, you're talking about, you know, you know. <laughs> yes. I think I would love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's something we want to look into. So I'm just, you know, jotting down notes on something like that, that we'd love to be able to just kind of put out there. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't care if it's two people or if we max out of Zoom and it's 100 people. It doesn't matter to me. Um, right. I just think it'd be really cool. So, so anyway, yeah. just jot it down. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Definitely, Dave. Um, you know, I, I want to get your thoughts on the pandemic, right? Obviously, we've been uh, dealing with this. <laughs> it almost seems like a, a so far a never ending battle um, with the, with the pandemic and, you know, its impact, um, you know, kind of personally and professionally on people, uh, certainly in this country. What, what's kind of your take, you know, on, you know, it, you know, its impact and, you know, how it impacts people and how it impacts business and then your business and the laundromat business, which is, you know, largely predicated on people having to be around each other, right, in order to right. um, to accomplish and, and, and you, know, you know, engage in the services. Um, you know, what's, again, what's kind of your take on that and, and what's been the impact? Yeah, the impact on us as an industry was tremendous. Um, but the good news is, one of the benefits of owning a laundromat is because we're a vital community resource, meaning we're needed, not wanted. Yes. And so we were deemed essential. Our entire industry was deemed essential, at least in America, and I think most countries. Yeah. Uh, no laundromats closed, ever. Right. Um, and so obviously people didn't necessarily come flocking out like they usually would. Sure. Because they were still afraid to be, like you said, in a group setting. And so there was a lot of things we had to do, like, you know, we already keep our stores really clean, but we actually doubled up on staffing and overly sanitized, which we already did anyways, because sure. we deal with dirty laundry. Uh, but we just kind of doubled down on those things, and all the best operators in the industry did that. Um, the reality is, when I talk to people across the industry, most of them saw anywhere from a 40 to a 60% hit in their revenue oh, wow. in the first two or three months, which is pretty pretty big deal. Um, but the good news is, most of them within four or five months bounced back pretty quickly. Sure. Um, people came in, yes, they were more hypersensitive, they wouldn't come in on busy days, you know, they would, it also kind of depends. I mean, there are a lot of laundromats are smaller, which means you can't really distance too well. Right. Um, some of my stores are smaller and some of them are quite a bit bigger. My bigger stores actually tended to get busier uh, because people could, you know, people could stay six, eight feet apart and with their masks still feel safe. Uh, but it, it, it impacted our industry. But, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in other industries that are small business owners, like restaurant owners and things like that. Yeah. And I literally know some of them that have filed bankruptcy that had amazingly healthy businesses wow. um, that are just financially destitute. So Jeez. I don't know anybody in the laundromat industry like that, but I know tons of people in the dry cleaning industry, which is kind of a service industry or a uh, sister industry of ours, um, that, that have literally is financially devastated them. And I know many people in the, in the restaurant world, um, you know, if you got a chain of 500 restaurants, hopefully you'll be okay. Uh, but if you just have a little mom and pop barbecue place or, or Kogi store or whatever, um, you know, 
I mean, I know many of them that are financially destitute and the, you know, it's, it's one thing if you take on the risk of an entrepreneur and you start a business and you don't do things the right way, sure. or you, maybe even you do things the right way, but you just make the wrong decisions. Yeah. Uh, maybe you over leverage yourself. I mean, once again, not that you deserve those things, but it's just kind of comes with the territory. Right. But when you run a business well and you're, you have a very healthy business, you're serving the community, you're doing everything the right way. And then something like this happens and takes it all away. I mean, that is the definition of helpless. Sure. Um, and that's a scary, that as an entrepreneur, we already take enough risk. Absolutely. Um, so to watch my friends and, uh, you know, parts of my tribe, as I call them, um, to watch them have to deal with that and get those phone calls. And um, I, it was terrible. I don't know how yeah. else to describe it, but it was just terrible. Yeah. Um, and that's just the business perspective. <laughs> that's not, sure. you know, I have 40 employees. And to give you a quick example, I have 40 employees. And in the same day, I had an employee call me. Um, this is early on in the pandemic, like probably week one or two when they started locking down. Yeah. I had an employee, employee call me one day and she begged me not to lay her off and not to fire her because she has a young family at home. She has a baby at home. Her husband had already been laid off and she was living oh, wow. paycheck to paycheck. She oh, was wow. in tears and she was begging me. She was like, no matter what, please do not lay me off um, because we won't, we won't make it. And within 20 minutes of that call, I got another call from another employee, hysterical, begging me not to make her come into work because she was convinced that if she stepped out her front door, she would die on the lawn. Oh my goodness. She was convinced of this. And to try to, I've always said, you know, as a business owner and just as a human being, one of my guiding lights in the, in the world is just always do the right thing, no matter what, no matter what the financial consequences, even emotional consequences, always do the right thing. Mm. And usually the right thing is clear. It's not always easy, but it's usually pretty clear. Yeah. And in this dynamic, I was almost in tears myself because there was no right thing. Like there, it was, it was just awful. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Wow. That being said, here we are a year and a half later, and we're not done with this thing yet. I get all that. But <laughs> right. the reality is that I'm a big believer in looking for the, the positive in everything. And uh, I've always been a pretty strong-willed human being. And I can't help but think that me and a lot of us entrepreneurs who have kind of been through the meat grinder over the last few years, I like to think that those things truly do make us stronger. Yes. I know they are cliches, but one of the things I've learned in life about cliches is they're cliches because they're set all the time. Yeah. And they're set all the time because they're true. Right. They're true. And that's what we forget when we just say, oh, that's so cliche. Well, but it's true. Mm. And so, um, you know, whether it's business ownership or even just, you know, parents navigating the whole school situation with their kids and uh, elderly parents who are high risk and all the different dynamics that society has had to deal with, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm glad we went through this as a world because I'm not. No one is. Yeah. But how about we just try to look at this and say, you know, let's try to find the good. There's plenty of bad. We can find that too. Let's try to find the good and see if this can make us better as a, uh, as a race. Um, so that's just how I personally, the perspective I try to take on it. Um, but it's been really tough. Is it mm. true? I got to give you the air horns on that, Dave. Um, definitely for <laughs> sure. I got to. That is just... Um... That is tremendous. Um, I just, I, I, you know, just great perspective and what you share with two different employee kind of scenarios and, and two different perspectives that they had. And, and again, it just opens up how you have to deal with that as, as a leader, right? And oh, that responsibility so uh, that we have with, um, with, with people's lives that are impacted by the decisions and the, the behaviors that we engage in. Um, again, yeah. it goes back to that fiduciary. Um, man, that, that's powerful. Powerful, man. Yeah powerful stuff. Um, listen, man, I've kept you way longer than I intended, but just because it's been so (laughs) doggone good, man, I just enjoyed talking with you, brother. Uh, for sure. I mean, I I love the, your approach to business. It it mirrors a lot of what me and my partner, that's how we came together was because we have that, uh, identical uh, view of, of the business. And, you know, like you said, you know, uh, you know, the laundromat industry, the real estate industry certainly has its, uh, you know, its black eyes in some cases as it relates yep. to uh, to things. And we just want to be able to, you know, you know, do our part to kind of change some of that narrative. And, you know, we, like you mentioned, we look for that, um, you know, kind of trifecta of wins, right, where, you know, community wins, you know, a homeowner wins and we win. 
um, kind of all together. And that's what we look for when we do deals. And it's great to hear that's what you look for, you know, every day, every time someone comes and, you know, puts money in the machine um, to utilize the laundry mat, um, you know, how you're looking to do that and how that's a part of the, the DNA uh, of your organization is, is just tremendous. And so we definitely appreciate that here uh, on the Minding Your Business podcast. And, you know, Dave, I'd like to kind of close us out with kind of you giving us so many great gems, man, but just kind of, you know, what's kind of two things that, you know, someone listening to this, right, um, walks away with when, when the podcast is done and they walk away and they go back into life, what are two things they can take with them that can just help them be just a little bit better? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking. Yeah. Um, I think the first one is that we as uh, human beings, you know, we all have different strengths, weaknesses, gifts. Some of us are smarter and skinnier and all these, you know, better looking and all these things. We can all make an impact on the world. Mm. And so don't ever cut yourself short. Um, don't ever let anyone tell you you can't. Your impact on the world may look different than mine and Ron's, uh, but we can all make a difference in the world. Um, and usually a lot bigger imp- influence and impact than we uh, give ourselves credit for. Um, so, you know, roll your shoulders back, stick your chest out and Mm. go leave your mark on the world. That was the, that's the first thing I would tell people. Uh, the second thing is, um, education is everything. Uh, but education isn't always found in a classroom. Mm. I'm not a, I'm not a hater of formal education or anything like that. By all means, I'm married to an educator. Uh, but the reality is I'm a, you know, I was a very, very average, if not below average student, um, in school, did not go to college. Um, but I joke with my wife all the time. She has multiple degrees and valedictorian in high school, valedictorian in college. I mean, she's never had to be in her life. She's like an academia in that way. And, uh, <laughs> and I've, I've never had to be in my life either, but it's because everything I had was C's and lower. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm kind of the other side of the equation. Uh, but the, 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 the sorry, <laughs> the, uh, the, the beauty of it though is I joke all the time with my wife that I'm one of the, one of the most educated people in the world that doesn't have a degree. Mm. So I don't have, I don't have uh, you know, paper on the wall and, and I haven't walked down the aisle with a verb on and all these things, Yeah. but I've read thousands of books. I've listened to thousands of podcasts. I've read thousands of magazines. And now I'm to the point where I'm doing my own podcast and I'm writing my own books and I'm writing my own. I write for one of our industry magazines on a, in a regular column that I write um, under the Wonder Matt Millionaire brand. Yeah. Um, and so education comes from a million different places. And I'm not here to hate on formal education or classroom environment. Sure. I'm here to tell you that there's a million ways to get an education. And that's one of them. But the reality is if you want to find success in life, you do need that education, but it can come from a many different ways. And usually the most successful people I find have multiple levels of these different types of what I call hybrid educations. Mm. Um, they're not just good at school or they're not just good at uh, auto mechanics or whatever. Um, so I think that's really the two things that I would, I would hope to leave with your audience. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, you talked about that belief, right? Don't let anybody just tell you what you can't do. You know, it's just having that right. innate, what I like to call tenacious, um, kind of focus, uh, towards, right. you know, what you believe in yourself. And then, you know, as you, you, you kind of wrap that up with, you know, the education piece and how, you know, the diversification of your edu- your education, um, really just comes into play. And those different forms, those different lanes of, of education and how uh, as as lifelong learners. Right. Um, right. You know, you can engage that, you know, because you think about it, you know, and, and I've never been one to, you know, kind of poo poo on, um, you know, formal education either. But you think about it, right. you know, for most people, formal education ends at 18 or maybe 22, 23. If you, you're going on straight to college, I mean, you know, at some point you know, th- that, that ends. And then you got the rest of your life, right. And you spend the rest of your life learning and engaging. And so if you're able to diversify that education, it gives you a nice uh, kind of runway, um, as you go through, you know, the entirety of your life, um, as absolutely. again, as that lifelong learner. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still reading to this day and I'll never stop. <laughs> there you go. People do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Uh, listen, uh, Dave Menz has been our guest today, um, the Laundromat Millionaire. Make sure you go to laundromatmillionaire.com. 
Um, he's got the book coming out in October. Um, pre-sales are going to start for that. You can see that all in the show notes, but make sure uh, that you're doing that. And another way to get uh, a nice runway uh, to the book and, and just learning more about Dave and, and his business is make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Go to wherever you're getting your pods as you're listening to this podcast. Go ahead and subscribe uh, to the Laundry Matt Millionaire podcast. Go ahead and do that um, for yourself. And I think you'll find yourself being just a little bit better um, by getting co- connected and plugged in with our guest today, Dave Menz. Listen, Dave, again, you, you, you've been gracious, man, to give me this time. And uh, I really appreciate it. You got it. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. I, uh, this was fantastic. I appreciate it, Ron. Yep, absolutely. So Dave Mintz, folks, uh, our guest today uh, here on the Minding Your Business podcast. And again, make sure you go to laundromatmillionaire.com. It's right there in the show notes. Made it very easy for you. OK, um, listen, before we get out of here, as you know, uh, I always say this. There's three things that unite us. Right. We all want to be a little bit better for uh, our ourselves. We want to be a little bit better for our families. and We want to be a little bit better for our communities. And if we keep all three of those things in mind um, as we meet people, as we go about, as we deal with everyday life, we can all make this place just a little bit better. Okay, so just keep those things in mind, you know, as we go about uh, your day to day life and you meet people, no matter where they are, no matter what side of the tracks they come from. Okay, Champ Ron, the Minding Your Business podcast. This has been episode 274. We appreciate your support. As always, check us out. We'll be back for 275. Uh, here shortly. But in the meantime, go be great. Keep a tenacious focus, smile and uh, be blessed. Take care. With MailChimp, you get a whole lot more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. That means you can connect your data to make more informed, smarter decisions. And you get powerful automation tools like our customer journey builder to ensure you never miss an opportunity to turn shoppers into loyal customers. So if you're ready to integrate your marketing and boost sales, get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. With MailChimp, you get a whole lot more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. That means you can connect your data to make more informed, smarter decisions. And you get powerful automation tools like our customer journey builder to ensure you never miss an opportunity to turn shoppers into loyal customers. So if you're ready to integrate your marketing and boost sales, get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses.